You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is time to get weird. It is time to get wild. It is time to get educational. It is time once again for everyone's favorite educational program. Yes, it is time once again for a little bit of the old options boot camp. My name is Mark Longo coming at you from the T-H-E optionsinsider.com as well as from the network upon which so many of you are just main line in these days. Hope you're having a good trading week. Hope you're enjoying our post Nvidia week. Still have a lot of earnings hitting the docket. A lot of people are kind of feeling the hangover, kind of feeling the malaise. They're wondering what is next? What is the next big thing that might be moving the market, which does lead to our question of the week, which we'll get to in a little bit. In the meantime, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else in the network, Throw a few likes, a few stars, a few comments our way. It does help people continue to discover the content. Just like this week's five-star review came from T-Jam. Just T-Jam. He says, good pod. Well, thank you. <laughs> he also says, more guest segments, please. Well, there you go. You know, we, we've been rotating more guests onto the show lately. It's a thing we used to do a lot in the early days. And then uh, it's been mostly Dan and I a lot in the last few years. But we like to mix it up whenever possible. We've had Matt from Orats on. We've had some of the folks from Tasty on recently and a few others. So. There are some guests in the offing. If you like a good guest, maybe hit us up, T-Jam. Who do you like? We'll see if we can get them on for you. But we do have a great guest roster, and we're, we are always looking to broaden the conversation here on Boot Camp because, you know, at the end of the day, that only benefits you, the listener. So, yeah, that's a good idea. I think keep an eye out and an ear out, I should say, really, for more guests in the near future. But thanks to everybody who takes the time to rate and review. It does help keep the new folks coming. Speaking of people coming, we are also joined now by the black hat one himself, Mr. Dan P. From Market Taker, mentoring what the cool kids call um to um. Mr. P., welcome back to the show, sir. Well, hello there, Mark. How are you doing today? I'm super excited to be here, as always. I'm always excited to be here. You're I'm a very I don't excitable know why. Always... fellow. I, I got I to gotta dial you back right before the show starts, because you're, you're just always at 11. And I need I to know. bring you back down to like a 7 to get the show going. I know. You know, so we'll see if we can we can keep him under wraps, listeners, as we head on into a little bit of the old basic training. All right, Boot, it's time to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Pull in. Prepare to learn. Yes, sir. All right, it is time, listeners, for a little bit of basic training. And Dan, you know, we've been thinking about doing it for a while, but now it is time. It is time to officially get stupid on Options Boot Camp. Are you ready? Are you prepared, sir? Um, I'm always prepared to be stupid. <laughs> Dan, always prepared at a moment's notice to get stupid here on the show. So what the hell? What are we talking about? How are we going to get stupid here? 
All right, we're going to talk about, Dan, this might be my favorite strategy of all time. And if you could see me, this was a video show, listeners, you would see I would have my hands behind my back and my fingers are crossed because I am lying. This is not my favorite strategy of all time. <laughs> might be one of my least favorite option <laughs> strategies. But nonetheless, Dan, to do our fiduciary duty to our listeners at the end of the day, our obligation, we must discuss all things, even strategies that maybe don't necessarily resonate with us. Uh, so let's start there, Dan. If I were to say to you, just on the face of it, stupids, are you a fan or are you not a fan? Where do you fall? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I go on the record saying there's always a time and a place for everything, but generally speaking, not a huge fan. Yeah, the times and places for stupids. <laughs> Pretty few and far between, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Totally. out there but you know we've had some people mention these we've been talking about them recently on the network in fact we saw one going up recently for size and some of our unusual activity uh, which brought us back to the conversation of stupids uh, if you've ever listened to our shows like uh, the option block and other some of our other long running content listeners you know i've made my position on this strategy quite clear but a lot of you are newcomers so let's start at the beginning an excellent place to start and what the hell are we talking about? What the F are stupids? All right, let's walk through what the heck we're talking about. Let's start with our traditional call spread, a call vertical. You guys all know and love what these are. You certainly are familiar with them. If you're not familiar with the traditional vertical spread, then stop listening. Go back to the early days of the show and really start from, start from the ground up. But traditional call spread, XYZ is trading around 10 bucks. You think maybe the upside's going to continue. You want to buy some premium, but maybe you don't want to shell out all that money. Maybe you think the upside's going to peter out somewhere around 15. I think it's going to happen fairly quickly. You're going straight to the front month. You buy a one month at the money call this time, the 10 call. You're going to pay a buck for it in our example. So pretty pricey. You're paying 10% of the value of the stock for this call. So obviously this is a, a meme stock type name, <laughs> short sale restricted, a little bit of upside juice. I think you're going to turn around and you got, you know, I don't think it's going to get past 15. And if it does, I don't mind letting my strategy top out. So you're going to sell the 15 strike call again, one month. In this case, you're going to get 25 cents for that. So you bought one option for a buck. You sold another one for 25 cents net. What did you do? You paid 75 cents for a $5 wide vertical, the 10, 15 vertical, uh, so obviously the max profit on that spread, if it goes beyond 15 at expiration, the max value of that spread is going to be hit. It's going to be worth five bucks. You paid 75 cents for it. So your net profit on that spread, pretty good, 425, not bad. Obviously your max loss, you are limited to what you paid for that spread. So if the stock closes below $10 at expiration, then you're going to be out the 75 cents that you paid. Pretty straightforward. You guys all know and understand that. But now let's go beyond that, Dan. It's time to get stupid. All right, what do I mean? Same scenario. XYZ, trading for 10 bucks. You think the upside's going to keep going? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> These strategies, again, it's called the stupid for a reason. So same thing. You come out, you buy that, that 10 strike call. Again, the front month call. It's going to cost you a dollar in this scenario. So, so far, so good. And now you're looking at the 15 strike call. And you're saying, you know what? Instead of selling that and reducing my overall outlay and buying a nice spread, $5 spread for $0.75, cents, I'm going to do what is called a stupid. <laughs> Instead of selling that call, I am going to buy that call as well. So now what have you done? You bought the one month 10, 15 stupid. You bought the 10 call for $1 and you bought the 15 call for $0.25. Cents. So instead of reducing your outlay, you've now added to it. You bought that stupid for a buck twenty-five. <laughs> so first difference, you can see obviously you paid fifty cents more for this thing. Uh, so you went from seventy-five cent outlay to a buck twenty-five. So that's your first thing that a lot of you are going to notice. You're spending more for this. Uh, your max loss is now a buck twenty-five. That's what you're paying for this thing. So if the stock closes below ten, that's what you're going to give up. On the flip side, your max profit is now gone from the potentially 425 to now unlimited. If this is a meme stock scenario and the stock shoots to high heaven, it pulls a GameStop and goes to 100, you're going to be a lot happier you bought the stupid than you are the vertical. So there's that, I suppose. <laughs> and this scenario, stock's got to close above, stock close above 1125. And beyond that, you will be making money on this spread. Now, why do this? Dan, that's a good question. 
Why would anybody do this? First off, let's, let's go back a little bit. Have you ever traded a stupid? I know I have never done so, but have you ever traded a stupid? Have any of your mentees traded a stupid? And if so, why would they do such a thing? Um, I mean, I, I probably have in my day, but barely ever. Um, there's usually no good reason for it. Uh, because you know, like, it's not like the strikes average out, <laughs> you know, it's not like if you're buying a, uh, uh, a, a 90 strike and a 95 strike that like it works out to be a 92 and a half strike. It, it ends up being just really dis indecisive if you trade them at the same time. Now, one reason off the top of my head, which I, I guess I, I didn't even really think of it, this until now for some reason, but if you like, sometimes people might leg into one and it could make sense if it's for the right reasons. Like, like maybe if someone is hedging a portfolio, like maybe you own a thousand shares of spiders, right? <clears throat> and you wanted, you want to start hedging your portfolio for a downward move by buying puts. Maybe you buy hedge 20% of your portfolio by buying some puts and maybe the stock goes a little bit lower and you think, well, I want to hedge a little bit more. So I'm going to buy another two puts to get up to 40% hedged, but maybe now it makes sense to do a lower strike. I mean, there, there's one reason off the top of my head where it could make sense, you know, like I, I'm reaching a little bit here, but that's, that's the best thing I can come up with right now. You know, that is the one caveat I have said in the past. I tend to refer to those as inertial stupids. I never like a stupid <laughs> at the outset, just doing it all together. I've never liked that. That's what I've said in the past too. You buy the 10 calls, stock starts taking off, starts running. And now maybe you're getting closer to that 15 strike. doesn't make sense to buy a call with four and a half dollars worth of intrinsic value. And that's a lot of outlay. Instead, you come in, but you think the stock's going to keep running. You can come back in and buy that 15 call. I'm not going to be trading a quarter anymore. I'm going to be trading a lot more. But that's the only way I've seen some sense for a stupid. It's kind of like you're, you're adding to the party. You're keeping the party going. You don't want to leave yet. You want to have more fun. <laughs> so instead of buying what you just bought before, that's already working for you, but that's more expensive. You buy something else a little bit farther along the chain that allows you to keep the party going without the ridiculous outlay. So I, I, I see those from a certain logical perspective. But yeah, the initial, the way I laid it out in this example, the buying the 10, 15 at the start, just doing it at the outset of the trade, full outlay, I, I very rarely have ever see any reason to do that you know some arguments i've heard in the past people like to spread out their liquidity maybe it's an illiquid name and you could get better fills if you do a couple on one strike and a couple on the other versus all of them i think that's a nonsense argument market makers are not idiots if you start trading on the calls they're going to bump up the entirety of the call wing as a result if it's an illiquid name so i don't think you're really getting a lot of savings there but i have heard that argument Sometimes we see it more in institutional circles as well. They want to effectively leg into a price somewhere in between those two strikes. So they use uh, the two strikes to do that. I've heard some arguments for that. Again, I don't really like this strategy. I could see some institutional arguments for why it might make sense, maybe splitting some of your deltas. If you're a large institutional fund and you're looking at just your net delta exposure, and so in that case, it might make some sense. You buy a few here, then you buy a few here, and you average out to some net amount of deltas, which is where you want it to be to begin with. Then I can maybe see an argument for that. Again, all of that is outside the purview of this show and outside really any use case that would fall for any retail listener of a show out there. I, I can honestly think, listeners, not many times where I would say, there's never a reason to do this strategy, but there's really never a reason to do the stupid the way we've set it up here. The way Dan mentioned, you know, the as I refer to them, the inertial stupids lagging into a little bit more upside or maybe downside if it's a put stupid. I could see an argument for that. You want to keep the party going. Now that the move has happened, maybe your outlook has changed and you want to keep the party going.
But outside of that, there's never really a reason for doing this. But that said, Dan, we have heard questions and seen some big trades going up in the strategy recently. So it seemed like it was worth approaching once <laughs> just to have it in our archives. So when people come along weeks, months, indeed years down the road, and they're like, you know, what the hell is a stupid? Here we go. We have the episode for them, Dan. We have done our due diligence on their behalf. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, you know, like, like, like I predicated this with, you know, like, look, it's super great to be open minded when it comes to trading. Um, there is a time and a place for everything. But, you know, stick to a few really, really good strategies. This is not a strategy that um, should be one of the ones in your wheelhouse that you're trading all the time. Um, but if one of your strategies is like hedging, like I mentioned, or maybe one of them is like momentum strategies where you end up laddering more into the trade, um, you know, you might end up in a, uh, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> you might end up being perpetually stupid. <laughs> is that what it is? Perpetual? I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, be open-minded to how, how that might like accidentally be used in one of your go-to strategies, but I, I sure wouldn't strive to make it, uh, make it a go-to strategy by any stretch. In this case, I usually advocate for being open-minded. In this case, close your mind, Dan. There, there's no reason to, yeah. to set, up, <laughs> set up a stupid at the beginning. If you want to leg into one over time, my uh, inertial stupid, I could see a little bit more of an argument for that, but don't, don't do this. Sometimes this show exists, listeners, to tell you what not to do. And in this case, it is the stupid. Don't do it. But now you know what it is, so you can avoid it as we keep on rolling right on into the mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail call. And Dan, our, our chat, our live listeners, always distracting. They saw the title about uh, Let's Get Stupid, and they immediately got to uh, Weird Al Yankovic, 80s references. <laughs> so, I love our, I love our <laughs> pro members. They're in tune with me. They love the good 80s references. We've got uh, Queen talking about Eat It by Weird Al. We've got uh, uh, Age says uh, he assumes this means this episode will be Weird Al Yankovic will be the guest and discussing his Dear to be Stupid album. Yes, I forgot about that album. Uh, kind of one of the unheralded Weird Al Yankovic gems. Unfortunately, no Weird Al on the show. I got a feeling, Dan, if we put out our feelers, I think we could get Weird Al. What do you think? That would be pretty darn cool, man. <laughs> I don't that know would be great. what he would bring to an options educational podcast outside of his sheer 80s awesomeness. But you know what? I'm open to exploring it, Dan. What do you think? Dude, that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> All right. Now I'm intrigued. We'll have to see if we could get, if we don't make it happen on this show, but if it's somewhere else, Dan, I'll make sure that you get the invite so you can come play along with Weird Al. Party like it's uh, 1985. What is that guy even up to now? Didn't they just do a movie about him? Didn't uh, the Harry Potter kid play him in a movie? Oh, you know what? I think so. That sounds familiar. Now, after the show, because of our chat, I'm going to go down a Weird Al rabbit hole after this show. So I blame all of our pro members for, for dragging me to the dark side, option God saying, you can't get eat it by Al Yankovic out of my head now. Make it stop. <laughs> you know what? You don't want it to stop. You want it to keep going, just like the much-anticipated market taker question of the week. What you got for us, sir? Is it Weird Al related by any chance? Oh, no, it's not, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, one thing I've been talking about uh, lately, and this is a little bit less option-centric, a little bit more macro, but what's been driving this market? Um, and I don't know I don't know if you talk about this on other of your shows here or anything, but this has been a very, very interesting market if you look at it and break it down. Because the S&P 500, you know, it's been kind of on fire and there's 500 stocks in the S&P 500, but 500 stocks have not been on fire. It's been like four or so. Uh, and it's been largely, I mean, I would say Magnificent Seven, but it hasn't been all of them. There's been like four or so stocks 
especially like NVIDIA and, and like AI that's really, really driven this. And like that creates a very, very interesting, uh, scenario for investors. Uh, I did our daily video on this. I think it was yesterday, uh, for people who subscribe at markettaker.com. Uh, and so like, I guess the question that I posed is, well, what do you do after or if the supposed bubble bursts on, on NVIDIA, which I'm not necessarily calling it a bubble, but some people are, but even if it's not a bubble, if there's a pullback, what, what stocks end up becoming good stocks to, to buy at that point? And it, it's probably not the AI stocks. Uh, I mean, you'll be able to buy them on a pullback, but all these other ones that sort of lagged, um, there's a good chance that even though they didn't participate in the upside, they might participate in the downside. So it's just going to create a really, really interesting opportunity. Uh, I, I guess that's a little bit, I'm, I'm leaving it a little bit open for people to muse. Cause I mean, I don't have a perfect answer to it, but it's a really important question to be thinking about. How dare you even suggest even hint at Mr. P mm -hmm. that Nvidia can go down. How dare you, sir? Yeah. <laughs> Questioning the dogma that is Nvidia can do not, but go up. Let's keep rolling. listeners. let's see what you folks have on the brain. Speaking of Nvidia, that was our question of the week last week. We said everyone is laser focused on Nvidia earnings, but how important is this announcement really to the market and to your portfolio? I think we all saw the answer to that last week, but nonetheless, we must get the thoughts, the wisdom of our audience. And our audience pretty much agreed with the market. 59.1% of you said it's very important. NVIDIA leads the market. 22.7% are so coming in at number two. And not much, it's overhyped. I could see wanting to believe that. I Just given what happened last week, it's kind of hard to make that argument. 18.2% coming in as much as other earnings. So pretty much nothing crazier than some of the other big names we've seen out there. Again, Kind of hard to make that argument in the wake of just the, the madness that was NVIDIA last week. Fast forward to this week, Mr. Dan. And you're right, it is an interesting market right now. One of the things that make it interesting is that uh, we don't really know what's next. Uh, that's our question of the week right now. We said with NVIDIA in the rearview mirror, what is the next big, and we use big in all caps, big market event that is driving your trading? And again, as always, if you don't see your preferred choice, then by all means write it. Send it in, reply, DM, questions at theoptionsinsider.com. That all works uh, to get your suggestion in. But we gave you four choices. We said the next Fed meeting or next earnings season, or maybe you don't see much really on the calendar to get you excited until the election later this year, or you're looking a little bit closer to home to the next CPI number. Uh, Mr. Dan, if you have an answer, have at it. And then B, more importantly, which way do you think our audience is going? Oh... Uh... I mean, I think that the whole Fed meeting inflation thing, well, certainly is still important, but it's important. It has waned a little bit uh, just because, um, well, a lot of the the debt market has sort of finally come around to like <laughs> – Okay, the Fed, you know the Fed's been saying this. The Fed's been saying they're going to do this for a year, but we've been saying the Fed's going to do this for a year, and finally they're like, okay, I guess if the Fed's saying they're going to do this, that's what they're going to do, and so it's sort of equilibrated a little bit. Um, and I think the people are finally realizing also we're in a low interest rate environment. Just because you might have started trading. 10 years ago or started your career in trading as a professional 10 years ago doesn't mean, you know, like look at a longer term graph, like we're in a low interest rate environment. Interest rates don't have to go down for the market to do better because the market's already doing arguably too good. Um, so like, there's just other things to look at. Um, I don't know. It's hard. I mean, I guess of these four choices, Fed meeting, earning season, election, CPI number, probably CPI number is the most important, but um, I think I think they're all important. I, uh, I wouldn't say there's not much to think about until the election. The election's probably going to cause some really big swings, 
But there's plenty. I, I, the other three things are definitely things to think about before the election. Yes. Well, our audience agrees with you. Nearly two thirds right now, 63 percent looking right to the next CPI number. And then after that, 22.2 percent saying the Fed. So over 85 percent of you are pretty much all talking about the Fed and inflation, which is kind of interesting. Some people were hoping maybe NVIDIA had moved us a little bit past that discussion, but nope. Still very much glued on what the Fed is going to do next. Then we have a tie for third between next earnings season and not much until the election later this year at 7.4% each. Get over there at options over there on the old Twitters and make your voice heard. All right. And then let's keep rolling out here. Let's go out to listener Danask. That looks like how that's pronounced. Danask wants to know. Regarding the suggestion last week that you could exercise a call after the close and use that stock to sell to capture an after-hour stock move, would the same hold true for a cash-settled option? Ah, well, there we go. There's the rub. Uh, Dan, as you will recall, last week we mentioned our discussion from two weeks ago about capturing the after-hours move. It was in Lyft at the time. I mentioned after that show, I had a discussion with our buddy, Mr. Overby, and he mentioned if you have a call option, you could, of course, exercise that, contact your broker in the after hours, exercise that, and then try to use that stock to sell at the higher level. So as a way to effectively do a little bit of after hours trading using your options, even though you're really not, you're still just trading the stock. But Mr. Danask, or perhaps Miss, we don't know, has a related question to that, Mr. P., they want to know if they could do the same thing with a cash settled option in the after hours, sir. What do you say? Yeah, you can. And like, here's here's a really important thing when it comes to option trading or anything with money or any game you're playing. Um, read read the fine print. Read the rules. Um, one of the best traders that I know. Um, we had him over to, this is a while ago, but had him and his wife over and another couple to play risk <laughs> of all things. I, I think it was just sort of a random thing. And his thing was, you know, he said he won and he's like, yeah, Hopefully you, know, you just, took Australia like, first, sir. That is the go-to strategy for all risk games. Yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and, uh, he said, yeah, I just, I like to play games. Like, just give me the rules of, of the game. I'll read them out and I'll figure out how to win. Um, I was listening to a podcast. I mean, it's kind of unrelated. I don't know if I necessarily recommend doing this, but it was somebody who like just was just making a crap ton of money by, um, by, by getting credit cards and like reading all the fine prints of like how you get bonuses and little tricks that you can use. And like, like that was this guy's job, basically getting credit cards and taking advantage of all the loopholes in the fine print. Well, I mean, the same with option trading, but it's not really even fine prints. Like all you have to do is go to the website of the exchanges that list some of these cash settled options. And we're mainly talking about SIBO here, I think, and just read like, when can I exercise this? What, what time of day is the cutoff? And like, there's your answer. Um, and, and, and I encourage people to do that. I mean, definitely send in your questions to me and Mark. We love talking about this stuff, but you know, like if you read the rules of the game, you play the game a lot better. Now, the downside is you're not going to get the stock to sling in the after. I think that's what he's looking for. Obviously this is cash seller, right? So in the case of, let's say, you know, Tesla, you exercise that option in the after you're going to get some Tesla stock, which you could use to now sell to capture the after hours move. Or maybe we were talking about Lyft. Obviously, oh, yeah. if this is cash settled, not going to be quite the same thing, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I <clears throat> fair enough, but you know, it's it it's just a it's a different game uh, because with some of the cash settled options like SPX, it stops trading on Thursday afternoon, but it's priced on Friday morning's open. And so, I mean, it probably does behoove you to wait until the last minute to decide if you're going to exercise it, just to give yourself some extra time for something to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the exact, it's not the same scenario, but it's, it's a similar concept. And I'm just thinking, because obviously let's say that in this scenario, this is obviously on some underlying that's popping hard. And in this mythical scenario, he has a cash settled option. <laughs> so I'm assuming it's a mid cycle thing. Like we saw with Lyft, right? 
where you want to try to capture that. In which case, they're probably, if you exercise that cash settle option, you call up your broker, they're going to exercise you at the closing price. They're not going to give you the after hours pop, I would think, unless this is some strange new aberrant uh, after hours. I don't know. I don't know if that's really going to get you. What was that? The NAS. I don't think it's going to get you what you want. It's not going to get you the underlying to sell. And it might get you a worse price because in the case of Lyft, it's popping in the after hours, but it closed at 12.04, right? So they're going to, they might exercise you at 12.04. And then the underlying is trading at 18 in the after hours, whatever the case may be, right? So I don't know if that's going to get him what he wants, Dan. Well, I mean, here's a scenario, okay? So like <clears throat> when uh, NVIDIA had its earnings, uh, I think they came out after the close. I kind of forget. Let's assume they did. Well, maybe you have some SPX calls that are just out of the money. And then NVIDIA's earnings come out and the conference calls going on and NVIDIA is up. I think it was up like 80 bucks after hours, if I'm not mistaken. So the SP, that SPX call is likely to be in the money the next morning. Like you could consider exercising it um, so that. Well, so that you make money, it's cash settled, even though it was out of the money when the market closed Thursday. I don't know. Like, it's been a long time since I got involved in a game like that. Like I said, just like read exactly when you can exercise, how it's settled, and if it makes sense, and if it does, do, and if it doesn't, don't. But yeah, like Mark says, it's definitely not the same scenario we talked about last time where you can just like, exercise and then short the stock because it's it's not a stock it's cash settled yeah i mean obviously spx is obviously european too so you can't really do it mid-cycle so this is a weird aberrant cycle where it's an american style option in his in his scenario that you can exercise i'm assuming at any time but is also cash settled uh, there are not many of those floating around <laughs> that i could think of off the top of my head that allow you to exercise at any time but also are cash settled so that that would be an interesting scenario Again, in this mythical scenario, then it would matter, as Dan pointed out, what the nuances of that contract are. If you exercise it mid-cycle, are you going to get the closing print at the end of that day? Are you going to get the opening print the next morning? In which case, you know, the scenario Dan lays out with SPX moving, you could, even though SPX, it's European, so you can't do that. So yeah, there's a lot of, lot of nuances. That's, you can see how fun things get with uh, exercise and settlement here. But yeah, the short answer to your question is I don't think the cash settled route is going, even though I don't think the product you're talking about really exists to a large extent for a lot of our U.S. listening audience, American style, but also cash settled. But that said, usually the example we were talking about that Brian brought up specifically was you want to have a way to capture that after hours move in the stock and you don't have the underlying to do it in your account and your broker for whatever reason is not seeing that call option you have as an offsetting position from a margin perspective. And so they're going to margin you fully as if you are going to short the stock and, and they're probably going to charge you a lot, in which case we've all seen what happened post GameStop. They're going to margin you very heavily. If you want to avoid that, if you can't afford to do it, but you want to still make that trade and capture that move, that is one backroom way that you could do it. Again, all the caveats we laid down on that episode, you have to call up really quick because you have to call the broker to do these kind of things. They don't make, you can't do it online. You have to hope you get in soon enough to exercise soon enough. And then you have to have that stock. You have to immediately say, okay, now I want to sell it. <laughs> so there's a lot of ifs in that scenario, which you do not have, obviously, in your cash settled uh, scenario. But still, an interesting one. This is why we like the listeners of our show, Dan. They always give us fun questions. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah, man. Like, honestly, this it's my favorite part. Totally. There we go. All right. That music means, unfortunately, we have come to the end of another journey through the world of basic training, a little bit of Options Boot Camp. If you want more in your lives, don't worry. Come back next week for Options Boot Camp. If you're on the pro side, we'll be doing a double header, a live double header for all of our pro members because I will be heading down to the FIA Boca show after that meeting with a bunch of different people in the world of options and derivatives to keep getting compelling content for you folks here on the network, but I won't be here for Education Wednesday, which is why we'll be doing a twofer next week, so look forward to that. If you're listening on demand, of course, just stay tuned. You'll be getting that on your feed at the appropriate day and time. But, Mr. P, before we get out of here, sir, if folks want to reach out to you, see what's cooking, maybe they just want to reminisce with you about the glory days of Weird Al. Where should they go? What should they do? 
Uh, make your way on over to markettaker.com, and I would love to chat with you. That sounds really, really great, really, really wonderful. There you go. Markettaker.com is the place to go. we got to get on out of here. That is going to do it for us on the network today, a rear light day for us. We were going to try to squeeze in an advisor's option, and unfortunately, getting all those ducks in a row of everybody's schedule. Sometimes it's challenging, so advisor's option will be coming up sometime in the next few weeks. So we're going to be back again tomorrow, of course, with the option block, as well as afterwards for this week and futures options. Friday, volatility views, and then after that, exclusively for you pro folks with a little bit of the old options oddities. We're going to have some fun special guests on oddities and on Volview, so stay tuned for that. Should be fun. Then back again next week with a little bit of the OB on Monday all the way through to next Education Wednesday, another episode of Options Bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>